Please stay tuned for important disclosure information at the conclusion of this episode. Well, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming out. We're really thrilled to be doing this live recording of The Long View. I'm Jeff Patak, Chief Ratings Officer for Morningstar Research Services. Christine Benz, Director of Personal Finance and Retirement Planning for Morningstar. We wanted to start off by thanking Ben for the warm welcome, also to the Ritholtz team for organizing this wonderful conference, and also the other conference organizers for their tireless efforts to bring this to fruition. At this point, I'm really pleased to introduce our colleague, Nizar Tarhouni. Nizar, if you're not familiar with him, uh, we won't give you sort of the full CV. He heads up research for PitchBook, which is a Morningstar affiliate. They're a premier provider of data on public and private markets. We're gonna focus a little bit more on the private markets for purposes of today's discussion. I would say it's very much aligned with some of the things that we've been talking about recently at Morningstar relating to the evolving investor. And sort of the concept there is it's not sort of traditional financial outcomes, it's also non-financial outcomes. It's also not just public markets, it's private markets. It's another important dimension that advisors are having to grapple with and manage through on behalf of their clients. And that's why we're so thrilled to have Nizar's time today. So I thought maybe where we would start, we're gonna get into manager selection and dispersion of returns and in many of the salient topics that are so important to you and to your clients that you serve when you're trying to make a prudent selection. But we thought that maybe a logical place to start was what's happening in private markets right now. Nizar and his team put out reams and reams of interesting research. Some of it is sort of landscape research that talks about what's going on big picture in the private markets. And so maybe I thought I would start there, Nizar, if you don't object. Maybe you could do a little bit of context setting. How many private equity-backed firms are there in the U.S.? And how does that compare to, say, the total number of listed firms on New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ? Thank you for the kind welcome. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I think it's been really fun for me to see just the get-ups of everybody here. I think the last conference I was at was in June. It was 85 degrees, and I was in a suit and tie with a lot of private equity firms. So I think it's fun to see just the environment here. Um, in terms of the question on inventory, I think like, if you go back to 2000, you had, I think there was roughly around 2000 privately backed companies, specifically private equity backed companies. And I think you had around somewhere around four to 5,000 um, publicly traded companies. And then if you went forward to 2006, the, there was this intersection where now you had around 5,000 private equity backed companies and 5,000 publicly traded companies. And then you fast forward to today, and now you've got 11,000 private equity backed companies in the United States, and you still have around somewhere in the four to 5,000 range of publicly held companies. And that doesn't even include the venture backed businesses. From a venture backed perspective, you've got over 50,000 companies today that are backed by VC that have raised a recent round of capital and haven't gone bankrupt, so they're still operating. And so I think the landscape, just in terms of the volume of what you're seeing in private companies, has actually gotten significantly larger. And then when you think about the private equity-backed businesses, some of those are smaller, right? The median deal size in a private equity-backed business is actually only $50 million. But you do have a tremendous amount of companies as well that are doing a billion or two in revenue. And now all of a sudden they start to compete and they look comparable to what you'll see in a lot of publicly traded businesses. And so I think the landscape of how people look at private companies is shifting quite a bit not only from how much time you have to spend with the volume of companies there, but also in the makeup um, of the businesses that are privately held. So, Naz, I wanted to ask uh, if you can help us get a scale, get a sense of scale of private and venture capital. Maybe um, to put it in perspective, you could talk about how big those firms are in aggregate relative to the market cap of all publicly traded companies. And then sort of a related question is if advisors are thinking about putting their clients in, in these types of companies, is that sort of a good way to right size position size as a percentage of an equity portfolio? Yeah, so, so you can look at it a couple different ways. I think, um, you know, if you look at the total market cap, um, and for us, we would use, for example, in private businesses or private equity, we'd look at net asset value. So total value that's remaining in a fund that's in the ground, in addition to capital that's been raised by these funds that hasn't yet been distributed. So just think about total net ass nav of a private equity of the private equity industry in the US. You know, collectively, that's only 5% today of the total US equity market cap. And if you look at the venture market, the venture market's actually only around 2% of the total US equity market cap. 
And those figures have both doubled over the last call it, three to five years. And so, yes, you've got, you know, the market's getting bigger, but as a percentage of the equity market, it's a very small sliver. And I think in terms of how you size a portfolio, if you are um, an advisor, I think it's really different relative to institutions. And I actually think like there's a lot of conversation around advisors wanting to be in private equity or in venture and alternatives in general. And I think there's a lot of danger there because when you think about placing money in private equity, what you see right now for you know retail or even high net worth individuals, the types of vehicles that are afforded to them or available to them, whether that's B Cred or Carlisle, like these are great asset managers, but they are very different products than what you're going to see the institutions in. And I also think when you think about an institution that's got a ton of diversification happening inside of alternatives, so they're they're finding different varying correlations, whether it's in a secondary strategy or in a private credit strategy versus private equity um, versus real assets. A lot of retail investors, what you'll see is, well, can we place them in a pure private equity fund or a venture fund relative to the public markets? And you're not going to get that same diversification there, and you're not going to get the same return profile that you think you might get. Um, And so I actually think sizing, there's no one size fits all, and it all goes down to the access of the type of strategy you get Whereas I think a lot of the strategies that are available to ultra high net worth or even retail investors in general aren't actually going to accomplish what people think they might accomplish or what they read about in the paper. It might actually be more of a detriment um, to that portfolio than, than a help. And we're going to delve some more into topics like manager selection, asset allocation, portfolio construction, which you've touched upon. I thought maybe briefly we would talk about trends, probably most manifest of which is performance. I think that PitchBook has developed a set of proprietary indexes to track the buyout, private equity growth, venture capital segments of the private markets. What's performance look like in recent years? So in, in recent years, I mean, it's kind of hard to to fully put it in, in perspective because you have a few different things working against you when you're valuing private businesses or valuing private funds. Number one is volatility. So I think, you know, kind of based on the last question you had in terms of sizing a portfolio for advisors, you get a lot of questions around, well, do you get outsized returns and do you get, you know, less volatility in private equity? Well, the returns that are reported are reported on a quarterly basis. Um, there's not an active, like, trading process to try to clear a transaction. And so pricing a deal or figuring out where something might trade at in the market that's privately held is difficult to do. So it's effectively an academic assessment of where you think that business would trade through a process. And I think what we've noticed historically is that firms tend to be very quick to mark up assets and very slow to mark down assets. And so at that point, when you try to level and think about, for example, like a sharp ratio, the sharp ratio you're getting from private equity is actually nowhere near what you're getting from a public market uh, or an equivalent buying a stock or investing in a fund when you think about really de-smoothing the returns and thinking about volatility. You're taking on more risk for maybe higher return in private equity. And so from a return perspective, we see, you know, I like to look at just vintages. So if you think about a fund 2012, 10 years ago, what we find is about six years in, the returns that are stated by a manager tend to actually converge with the real returns that they end up realizing. And so a good barometer of that is if you go back 10 years, now we know those returns are pretty much real. And a lot of that capital has been distributed back in private equity in the U.S. You see, you know, we use a PME to take a look at a dollar in private equity versus a dollar in the public markets using the S&P 500 outperformed by about 9%. And then if you look at the venture markets, it's a bit higher where you see a dollar in in the S&P versus venture outperformed by about 25%. Um, But then if you look at private credit, a dollar in private credit then versus today unlevered, actually underperformed the S&P. And a lot of that's that's totally okay because the people investing in that strategy aren't necessarily looking for a return. They're looking for income. And so on a relative basis, you've seen some outperformance, but I think what you don't get with that is thinking about, could you stomach that volatility through periods of illiquidity? Um, And if we look at it recently, you know, we do measure indexes. We try to get a sense of how NAV and distributions are moving every quarter. Um, You've seen private equity decline over the past three to four quarters. Um, and you've seen them mark assets probably lower, more in line with public marks faster. What you've seen with venture is effectively a few quarters of no marking down. And then all of these, all of a sudden you saw massive markdowns over the last couple of quarters. And effectively what you got there is you've got, you know, a big plethora of companies that have become unicorns. We've got 800 of those today. That's double what it was two years ago um, that can't raise capital in the private markets right now. If they need to go public, their comps don't look very great. 
And so you end up seeing, you know, a ton of down rounds that are coming to market. You're seeing VCs unable to distribute capital back to LPs. So all of a sudden now they're forced to mark down those assets. And so even on a quarterly basis, you're seeing that asset get marked down by 10, 11, 12 percent on a quarterly basis. So can you discuss deal activity and how that has trended recently? Yeah, so I'll break that up private equ- into private equity versus venture. On the private equity side, you've seen kind of deal value, which will probably decline by about 20% year over year, and it's kind of done that for the past two years. Um, but you'll see volume actually remain relatively healthy, and we'll unpack why here in a second. And then if you look on the venture side, I mean, you've seen volume is actually probably going to be relatively flattish, probably a little bit down, but value is going to come in down you know, some 50% on a year over year basis. And so if we start with private equity, effectively what you've seen, again, you hear a lot about the big transactions, the multi-billion dollar deals, median deal size in private equity is $50 million. So if you think about what's happening is effectively you're seeing managers say, well, I can't get credit to fund an LBO. And if I do, my yield to maturity is going to be somewhere at 11 or 12%. Spreads have widened. They've come in a little bit, but for the most part, they've widened from where they were a couple of years ago. And you've got a base rate that's obviously three to 400 basis points higher. And so now a lot of those assets can actually take on that debt. And so what you end up seeing when you have massive fundraising in a market is you see bigger shops come down market and they can over equitize a transaction and they can swallow the whole thing up. And so, but in order to do that, particularly if a company needs to trade, now they've got a bit more leverage when it comes to valuation. And so they're paying lower prices for them. They're paying lower multiples for some of these smaller transactions and they're able to staple them onto an existing platform and get growth. And so I do think you've seen private equity put money to work in that way with less debt And perhaps you fast forward two, three years and they refinance, but right now they're able to do that. In the venture market, what you're seeing is effectively a big chunk of companies that have gone, you know, we're used to raising money on a year or a year and a half cycle, but all of a sudden have been frozen out of the market. And you've seen a group of venture investors that have basically said, in order to do a deal, we either need to come in at a lower valuation um, or we need to add a little bit more structure or we need to have more liquidation preferences on a transaction. And in order just to go through the paperwork that takes to work through your lick prefs, your lick prefs and things like that, that deal takes a lot longer to close. And also it takes quite a bit of time to, to kind of benchmark the, optimi- the optimism you'll see from a lot of founders versus what the VCs are looking at today when you think about pressure from their LPs. And so you've seen valuations start to decline precipitously, even in new rounds in venture. Um, we've gone from effectively zero to 3% of rounds being down rounds to, I think today we've got close to 15% of rounds in the market right now are actually being marked lower from their last valuation. And so you have a tremendous impact on employees and founders. And those are the people that are getting, you know, marked lower and and are having to deal with more, um, dilution. And so deal flow has, has been okay, but it's come at the expense of valuations on the private equity side and on the venture side, it has come at the expense of kind of the employees and the founders, but it's a different market today. I wanted to jump ahead and talk about strategy and manager selection. Your team put out some very interesting research on persistence of performance, persistence of returns from say one fund to the next fund. What did you find? Did you find that there was any sort of relationship between past and future performance? I mean, I think it all comes down to the individual manager. I think there's nothing there collectively across the asset class that I think will actually tell you that there's full-blown persistence across, you know, across the entire asset class. I think what you'll find is, you know, we've seen managers that you would say are maybe lower quartile to bottom quartile managers that somehow just continuously raise capital on a, you know, they've got three or four vehicles and some of that's due to the makeup of when they've signed up brand new LPs who commit to two or three vehicles. And you see managers who have tremendous persistence um, and, and are incredible risk takers. I think, you know, in terms of from an advisor perspective, I think that's, for me, it makes the conversation around, can you put more retail investors in private equity or in alternatives or in venture? Um, it makes it a tougher conversation for me. I think there's a lot of optimism about trying to include that pool of capital in private equity. But I think the, the manager selection piece is where I think part of that falls down. And so, you know, access to the best risk takers in the world. Typically, those funds have large institutions who have large swaths of capital they put in and are committed for many, many, many years, if not decades. And they typically don't need to necessarily raise more capital from others. And what I worry about is then you see from a manager selection perspective is net newer managers with less track records who haven't had persistence for a long and for a long period of time. And they're the ones who end up trying to tap the retail market. And so you end up actually putting investors who need more liquidity and need better sharp ratios in less proven managers 
without performance persistence. Um, and so I think it varies, but it, it certainly comes down to access to the type of manager that you're putting money in. Yeah, relatedly, you found that the range of returns among private funds is, is much wider than it is for public markets. Um, for instance, over the two decades ended at December 2022, you found a 10% uh, more than 10% annual gap between the top and bottom quartile of PE funds, and it was even wider for venture capital. So it seems like that puts a premium on fund and manager selection. Kunal referenced this yesterday in his conversation. So how can an advisor improve his or her odds of success on the manager selection front? It's a, it's a great question, and one that I think is really hard to to answer in one simple way. I think, you know, from an advisor perspective, a lot of it comes down to how much money can you actually put to work and what's the capacity you have as a platform. And I think what we've seen is where we've seen larger advisors who pool a tremendous ca- amount of capital together across their platform or find ways to also allow a lot of individuals in their platforms to invest directly with sidecar vehicles tend to have a little bit more control over the fee structure, which improves, you know, the outcome that they're going to get. But I think when you see advisor platforms that look to just simply find some sort of small allocation in a larger fund or with bigger managers um, that has a little bit more liquidity involved, typically what we've seen is the more liquidity a fund offers, the less return it's typically going to offer. And so I think from that perspective, the relationship with a manager that you're invested in truly has to be long term in nature. And so when you look at institutions who've been able to seed big GPs over the past decade or two, typically they've committed capital to three or four vehicles at once. And so if you're committing capital to three or four vehicles at once, that means you're building a 12 or 13 year relationship right off the bat. And I think you're also okay with that illiquidity for 12 or 13 years because you're going to reinvest into multiple vehicles before you ever know how they really perform. And I think that's probably hard for many advisors to do depending on the size of saying, hey, I'm going to put money to work and it's okay. We don't need to know what the return profile might look like. And I'm okay with the illiquidity for 12 years. And I think you might, depending on you know who you're serving, you might have some investors who are, or, or individuals who are okay with that. And you might have some that simply aren't. And so I think it's a challenging question, but it really comes down to, can you put together the capacity of capital that's really attractive to a GP that also allows you to get preferential treatment in some of your return stack? Um, and in the fee treatment, do you have the sophistication to underwrite some of the direct opportunities you might have alongside that manager? And can you do that for an extended period of time? Maybe to take the glass half full sort of argument, especially from an advisor's perspective, you've got upfront commitments, lockups, typically longer time horizons. One could argue that those things protect you best from the devil you know, which is yourself, or in this case, your client. And so do you think that the structure in and of itself, well, it suffers from some shortcomings, it actually can confer some behavioral benefits because it basically enforces patience and not acting impulsively to one's own detriment? So I think, you know, I think the public markets hear a lot about you, know, you can't time the market and you've got to have a consistent allocation, you have to stick to it. I think one of the things that I think is helpful with private equity is when you're picking a top manager or a top core top manager, Ironically, what you're really paying for is someone who can time the market. Like that's a lot what you're paying for in that illiquidity premium. So if you look at private equity alone, for example, you know, if you're a majority holder of a, of a private business, there are many levers you can pull if things aren't going well or in a challenging economic environment um, to help that business grow or to help that biz or to stabilize and stop the bleeding. You can you can take the keys if you need to. If you're in private credit and you're a first lien investor, same thing. Like you can have the keys turned over to you in a, you know, there's a negative probability scenario that occurs. Um, And so I think there in a market where you might see things in the, which is why I think the private equity returns haven't been marked down as fast as kind of the venture ones today. is I think what you basically see is that you're in an asset where the manager can actually step in and control the situation a bit more than if you're in a stock or or if you're in a venture backed portfolio company. Um, And so from then you're paying for that manager to be able to recognize an adverse event, step in and help rectify that situation and help preserve the capital um, for for the investors in the fund. I think on the private side or on the venture side, it's a little bit different because you are in a power law business where the majority of the investments that you do in that fund are not going to work. And if you end up in an environment like we're in today where yields spike the way they have over the last couple of years, 
you are going to heavily discount those future cash flows. And there's not a lot you can do about that. And then you also start to dry up capital into an asset class that needs multiple rounds of continuous funding. And so, for example, if you're at the Series B or C level and you've got to invest heavily in sales and go to market and that capital dries up, but you have no, you know, no option but to take that and your equity pool drops and now you can't hire as well, you know, those things are really hard to stomach. And so from that perspective, I think you end up just kind of SOL in venture. But if you're in private equity, I do think that's a place where if you can handle the liquidity, I mean, you're paying that manager the time to market well. So we wanted to ask about the PitchBook private equity barometer, and maybe you can talk about what that is. But um, I have a second question, which is that you track uh, private equity valuations relative to fundamentals, and you found that private equity valuations largely overshot fundamentals in 2020 and 2021, but they underperformed fundamentals last year and earlier this year. So can you talk about those divergences, but also just just what you're trying to do with that barometer? So we have a quantitative research team that effectively will take a plethora of different macro um, data points, and we'll tie that to our transaction flow, our valuations, and our fund returns, and our fund cash flow data from the underlying funds that we track. And effectively, what we try to map is can we, can we help create a bridge between where a manager might mark their portfolio versus where it's really going to land? Um, and what we found in 2021 and 2022 is that, of course, you had you know, private equity firms that were actually performing significantly better than where we thought the market should mark them. Um, and then what we're seeing today is obviously the opposite. I think it's, it's, it's not rocket science. Why? I think all of a sudden your cost of capital goes from 6% to 13%. Your assets don't perform as well. You've got to triage things a lot harder. You can't put money to work at the same clip. Um, and that fund structure that allows you to create those levered returns kind of goes away. Um, but effectively, what we're trying to man- measure there is that bridge between real returns and where a fund might be um, marking them. And what you're seeing today is effectively, I think the marks are coming down where they probably should have been. Um, and like I said, I think private equity is a lot easier than, than venture to manage that. But it's also not immune to you know the broader macroeconomic environment. You mentioned some of those fundamental inputs to the barometer before. I think that you found that private equity performance is positively correlated with the performance of smaller companies, and it's negatively correlated with things like financial stress indicators, high yield spreads, and the like. Do you think in a roundabout way that's sort of a confirmation of sorts that when you boil it down, private equity investing is a bet on sort of investing in smaller companies that have gotten cheap and doing so with borrowed money, or do you think that's too oversimplistic? I think when when rates are at you know where they were two three years ago, I think that holds true a bit more. I think if you look at firms like you know Dan Raspi's in it for Dad Capital, which a lot of what they've done is is say, can we take small cap companies that can afford to take on more leverage, and is that a good proxy for private equity? And what you found is in a low rate environment, it worked pretty well. What you're finding today in this environment is it doesn't work as well because those companies also, you know, if you think about the leveraged loan market where you're pricing debt that, that, that's floating and all of a sudden that rate spikes up on you quite a bit and you have no financing capability unless you can actually grow your cash flows to cover that down, that's really hard for a smaller business to stomach. If you are a larger business, well, then all of a sudden you have a lot more options in terms of you probably have more cash flows. You could probably raise more equity. Maybe they're not at great terms, but you can do it. You can also get creative with your, your payment structures for, your, um, for the credits that's on your cap table. Um, you've got private credit offerings that can do delayed draw type pieces that allow you to sit with kind of unitronch solutions. You clean up that balance sheet, whereas you don't, you don't get that for some of those smaller businesses. And I actually think it, it's really challenging. So I think what we're seeing today in this market is that um, that's not really what you're seeing is a levered bet on small companies. I think the leverage component alone is what throws that equation off. So you've referenced the volatility smoothing dimension of all of this. I guess Cliff, Nat, Cliff Asness calls it uh, volatility laundering, whatever you want to call it. And, and you and the team have measured that um, and found that reported private equity volatility was only about half of estimated actual volatility, and in the VC space, the estimated volatility was about two and a half times what was reported. So what are the implications for asset allocation and portfolio construction for advisors, potentially, who are looking at this area? I think, I think that's where it comes back to 
to capacity and manager selection um, and, and who you're trying to serve. And so I think from an advisor perspective, you know, let's take a look at venture on its own. You know, venture, that's the most volatile asset class you can be in. Like most of the things you do fail. Um, I think the, the common like perception or anyone investing is like, I don't, I don't know. I don't think any of us like losing money and I don't, anyone, I don't like buying a portfolio of stocks and just assuming that, you know what, 70% of these might actually suck. And like, but if I can make money on 30%, I feel pretty good. And so I think with venture, like that's what you get there. And so I think what we've tried to do is unpack and, and just try to draw a little bit more education to you are dealing with a very volatile asset class. You're going to see a lot of red on all of your statements for many, many years. And you better hope that that manager has a selection capability to actually get you above the curve. Now, if you look at the best managers in the world, like the Sequoias of the world, they don't take public money. They don't need, you know, retail money. They don't need advisor money. And part of that is capacity. If you look at a benchmark, it's the same thing. It's they've got a strategy that works with a certain fund size. I don't think it's any different than a hedge fund saying, I don't want to get past a certain size because I can't make my strategy work. And I think that's what you see. Where I always find concerns is where you find a venture strategy that typically works in that 250 million to 5 million, 500 million fund size strategy. Say all of a sudden we want to go to a billion and a half or a two. Well, then the first place they're going to tap is they're going to leave the institutions and they're going to try to get advisor money or, or retail money. And you're seeing that right now. But then the strategy, the economics get thrown off and then you need more managers and that creates a tougher investment committee meeting. And then you need more parameters around how you go forward with a, a transaction. So that extends the time that you actually take the due diligence and put money to work, which then there's an opportunity cost. So I think in, in, in general, like it's a very volatile asset class. And unless you've got the ultimate sophistication and the access to a particular group of managers, I don't think it's actually the best place for advisors to be. And I think you're better off being in a more liquid, you know, equity market. Um, kind of just to hammer on maybe a little bit of like that piece of why I don't think it makes sense. One of the things I like to look at is if you look at the correlations within alternatives. And so if you look at an institution that's putting together a strategy in, in alternatives across 12 different pockets, they might be in private credit or in secondaries, real assets, et cetera. You've got a correlation with private credit that's actually 60% correlated to private equity because all that is, for the most part, 70% of those deals are going to support leverage buyouts. Um, but And if you look at it from a PME perspective, they actually underperform the S&P. But that's okay because an institution is typically in a private credit fund might be going into what we would call a master feeder structure. And so they're investing in something that with a new vintage, but they actually have access to the entire loan portfolio over the life of that firm that's still active. And so they get income in the first quarter after investing. And then after five years, now they've got three years after that where they can get their principal out, but they're actually getting income the entire time. If you're a pension plan or a scholarship funder, et cetera, that's valuable to you to preserve your capital and get income because you need that cash flow. I think for the advisor or the retail market, you might not have that level of complexity. And that's just scratching kind of the tip of the surface um, to need that. And so if you're just looking at private equity or venture alone, um, I don't think it does many individuals all that well or all that good. Since you mentioned correlations, I think that when you've done the work that you've done, correcting for some of the return smoothing, it's probably yielded some insights, as you just referenced, into the true relationship between different types of alternative private market strategies. What do you think are some do's and don'ts? I mean, apart from maybe buyer beware, which it sounds like is an overarching message that you would convey to many advisors out there, especially as it relates to, to venture. But as it relates to sort of portfolio construction, maybe do's and don'ts an advisor would want to keep in mind when it comes to combining different types of alternative strategies in a diversified portfolio and knowing what you know about return smoothing and correcting for it? I mean, I think it's, one of the things I think about is like, can you, in an adverse scenario, just getting the fetal position and sit in the corner and are you okay with that? And if you're someone who used to manage actively, I think it's, it's a very tough market to be in and you need to be able to like handle those questions with the constituents that are investing or that advisor is representing. I think one of the things you have to think about, you need consistent time commitment. And so if you're not going to get access to the top quartile managers, which the reality is you won't, like you won't get that. Those, those managers are, have institutions in place. It's easier for them to work with them. They've known them for years. Like the reality is you're not going to get access to who's currently a top quartile manager for the most part. So if you're identifying a budding star or a net new manager that's coming to market and you're going to make that bet, well, then you have to be prepared to make that bet for a few years 
over an extended period of time because you're, you'll invest today and you'll have no clue over the next three to four years how that fund is really doing. You'll have some signals, but again, things are marked slowly. And then you got to invest in two years. When they come back to market, you've got to put money in that fund. And then when they come back two years after that, you've got to put money in that fund. And you have to be able to do that across a platform of multiple managers. So I think one of the things is you have to kind of ask yourself, can you actually commit to that type of longevity in a private strategy? I think the second piece um, is you've got to figure out if you can actually get capacity. And so, you know, we've seen some firms where, you know, like, all right, we have clients who are RAs who say, hey, we want to do, you know, SMAs for certain firms and we'll get a handful of people together and, and they want to maybe get some direct exposure. I haven't seen that really work that well. I think what we've seen work well is a firm says, you know, we're going to scavenger a thousand families that we represent and we're going to see if we can actually come in as a single LP with institutional terms and we're going to be able to step in the same way that New York Life Insurance might step in. And from there, we want a sidecar vehicle. We want to invest directly. We're going to put a team together that can actually underwrite these deals directly as well, which helps us save some money on the fees and get better information rights. And we also have the team in place who understands what that looks like. Um, And so if you can get that kind of capacity and you can commit for a longer term and you've got the stomach to do that, I do think you can have some success. It's more of the, you can't dip your toe in this market. Like, I think that's the thing that I feel like I read a lot about of like, well, I think now they're just going to let retail investors step in and like, it's not that easy. It's not that simple. And that might be more adverse than, than helpful. One question um, that's been on my mind as you've been talking, Nas, is I would imagine advisors often have clients who have some business in their orbit that they are inclined to invest in, you know, where the client's saying, oh, my buddy from law school is doing blah, blah, blah. Do you have a, sort of a some talking points that advisors could use about the universe of small companies and sort of the risks of making that sort of direct investment in a business? I mean, I think, I think to a certain extent, you're probably always going to have someone who says, my college roommate just started this. I don't really care. I'm going to put money into work in it. And because it's more, it's an emotionally driven decision. It's not necessarily a financially driven scenario, even though we might mask it as such. Like, that's what that is. And I think to me personally, I'm not an advisor. It feels like that's a hard one to walk somebody off of if it's like a close personal thing. I think in general, though, it's, it's, it's the ability. Can you truly underwrite it? And it doesn't have to be perfect, right? Like you're going to underwrite a transaction that's a small company that's maybe not that old or doesn't have, you know, fast growing cash flows, you're going to, but you're not going to be able to underwrite it with a traditional kind of DCF the way you would do a public company. But can you have some sort of mental model or a foundation in place to, to help you walk through what the outcome of scenarios could be and what the probability of those scenarios could be? Um, you know, we see investments, even at the venture stage, I think you hear a lot. You hear a lot about, we're just investing in people and we're making a bet on this person. But I guarantee you, if you look under the hood at a lot of these VCs, that's not what's happening. There's a tremendous amount of work that goes into how they value a TAM, how they value maybe any metrics they have. If they've got any product market fit or product usage, they're looking at that with a fine tooth comb. There's so much work that goes into what is the true addressable market? What is the real serviceable market? What will actually cost for us to penetrate that serviceable market? What would have to happen for this to go wrong? How do we think about the range of scenarios in two years versus five years? There's so much work that goes in. It sounds better to say, well, we're just investing in a person. I really love this person, this founder. They were so hungry. You know, most founders like can be pretty hungry, but there's a lot of work that goes under the hood to create some sort of mental model to help those firms evaluate those businesses. And so if an institution is going to do that, every individual and advisor should also be trying to root themselves in something like that as well. It's not just a bet on, you know, a charismatic founder who can actually just go drive a business. I wanted to ask you about private credit. It's come up earlier in the conversation. Uh, It seems based on the research that you've done that institutional demand for private credit has cooled off a bit this year. And so it, it seems natural that they would start passing the hat around amongst high net worth individuals many of them represented by advisors who are out there. So, so given that, it, you know, if you had to provide counsel to a financial advisor who was diligencing a private credit deal that they were being pitched, what are like two, the top two or three questions that you think they ought to be asking themselves on behalf of their client to make sure that that's the sort of pitch that they should accept on behalf of their client? Private credit, I actually absolutely love. I think it's a great strategy for 
advisors and institutionals alike. And I also think there's there's various market tailwinds at play and dynamics that, that serve it really well today. So I think one of the things most institutions in private credit, there's some alpha they're looking for, but they're not. It, it's usually, again, it's a sleeve within the alt portfolio. And if you look at a PME from you know 2012 in private credit, it's, it's probably performed at 70% of what you'd get in the S&P 500. But again, there's a couple structural pieces here. The good private credit funds, many of which can serve an income need. You know, you're in, like I said earlier, you're in something called a master feeder vehicle. You invest in a new vintage, but you have access to all the loans in the portfolio. Those managers can actively trade some of those loans. They typically also have mandates to trade broadly syndicated loans within that private credit portfolio. Um, and so there's ways to make sure that there is more continuity in the income stream um, that's coming you know, to investors. And so to the extent that you're looking at it as a preservation of capital with income coming on a consistent basis, that's a good place to be. And I actually think it serves that need really, really well. I think one of the things where you fall is everybody even today wants to benchmark it and say, okay, well today the yield of maturity on a private credit deal should be 12 to 13%. That's what it's going to cost. So great. I want to be there. Well, again, you can't take a business's cost of capital from 6% to 13% and then assume that like, you know, that's a good place to be because the business might not be able you know, they might default on that. And two, if you are also in, you know, especially on our end institutions or larger advisors, if you're in the credit of these companies, you're probably somewhere exposed to the equity of these businesses. And so if the equity starts to fall apart at the same time that the credit's picking up, you're just kind of washing things out. And, and even if you look at some of the big managers like Carlisle, et cetera, or Golub or, you know, KKR, a lot of them fund many of their own transactions. You'll see their credit funds are also on the cap table of the companies that they've done the equity deals in. And so you just, you know, in some ways, the equity declines while the credit goes up. And so you don't want to benchmark on rate of return. One of the things we look at is you want to benchmark on loss rates. And so if you look at a portfolio and you say, okay, out of all of your 10-year history in a credit fund, how many deals have you actually lost money on that you haven't been able to actually recoup in some capacity. And you'll see everything from 300 to 400 to 500 bips all the way down to nine basis points. And those are the funds you want to be in where people learn how to preserve capital and make sure that you don't lose your principal and the income continues to step in. The other piece that you want to ask about is covenants. So if you looked at, you know, 2008, when private credit stepped in, you know, the federal, the bank basically, and the government basically said that the banks couldn't lend to a lot of these leverage buyouts past six times leverage. Well, private credit could, and they could step in with a simpler solution, but then the covenants got really, 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 really loose. And so all of a sudden then you were basically competing um, on the lowest set of terms. And so if you look at the big shops, whether it's Aries or Golub, et cetera, you know, they've got the capacity to be able to do that and step in if they like a company without the covenants. Whereas if you're in a smaller fund, even a fund that's got eight or nine billion in AUM, you know, the covenants matter. And do you have the ability to actually step in and help? Can you? And it doesn't mean, I think people think about covenants as if they trip them, well, then the rate's going to go up. Most of these vehicles are not trying to hurt the portfolio companies that they're in, but they're trying to see it earlier. They want information rights. They want to know when things might pop up and they want to be able to actually like help rectify that situation for everyone. And so covenants can actually be an incredible thing in this market. And you are seeing more of that step up. Um, and the last thing I'd say is, is the funding base. So most private credit funds, many of them, you know, you see them, they've raised $2 billion, but they're probably deploying somewhere in the world of four to six. And so they're typically pretty levered. And that leverage is traditionally coming from the banks, ironically, that's not allowed to lend to the portfolio companies at more than six times, but they're usually giving most of these funds quite a bit of fund level leverage. And you want to get a sense of, are you levered at two to one, three to one, four to one? The bigger shops can be levered anywhere from five to six to seven times. And the smaller shops are going to be levered. You know, there's a fund without naming names here in town that's a sick, they've got a few hundred million AUM and they're levered at three times. And so you've got to figure out those levered returns can be pretty nice, but you also have to figure out, are you okay taking that on? Because that funding base, for example, this, this has happened in history is you lever a fund and the bank shows up and says, hey, we're totally, you've done nothing wrong, but we need you to draw that leverage down. Well, then the whole economics of that entire vehicle goes out the window when all of a sudden you've got to take equity out of a fund to pay down the debt. And so what do you see these managers doing? They spin it out and they put it in a CLO. And who tends to be the buyer of the, of the AAA tranches and the CLOs? It's the banks. And so you've got to find ways to see, do they have the ability to actually shift that leverage off into a 12-year note, into a CLO, et cetera, or do they not have the ability or the track record of doing that? And if they're levered and things don't go well for them or the bank decides to pull it down, well, now you're stuck with a very different 
return profile at very different sharp ratios. So in general, it's loss rates um, and loss rates in the funding base and the leverage is pretty big. So we wanted to ask about the IPO market. The market for VC-backed private firms going public has frozen up uh, for all intents and purposes. Do you see any signs of a thawing on the horizon? I don't, personally. I think you'll see, you know, if you're Instacart going to market, I think, what, a nine-something billion dollar valuation. I think it's a third of what their last private market valuation was. That doesn't feel great to anybody there. Um, I they probably, you know, if they could, would raise another private capital round, but also, you know, it might just make sense to, to go to market now. Um, you look at like a, a Kava, for example, which did well, but that's not really a technology business. Um, but I think it's hard. You know, if you look at, so we track an index of VC, we have a VC backed IPO index. So we track companies that went public, that were venture backed over the last two years. And if you looked at in 2021, even beginning of 2022, from a price to sales perspective, those companies were trading in the public markets, just recently in public at 25 times sales. And that actually shot up quite a bit. And then if you looked at it today, those companies are trading at five times sales. And it's basically been there for like four or five quarters. And so I think what you're hearing is in the in the equity market, sure, we've had this run up soon, but you're still seeing those that pool of companies that were venture back with venture back profiles in their P&L. Nobody really wants to touch them with a 10 foot pole. And people are nervous about their ability to actually get to a place of profitability and um I think that makes it hard when you think about the pool of private companies that would go to market with that type of P&L. Now, from a unicorn perspective, you've got 800 companies that are current unicorns. That's a number that's grown more than double over the past few years. And the average of those companies has actually raised, the median company in that cohort raised money 17 months ago in a very different valuation environment. So what happens in a boardroom then is, do we raise money at a significant down round, which is starting to happen, do we think we can shift the PL to go to market and get some sort of traction? But either way, it's probably not going to be a great outcome for a lot of the founders, the VCs who have re-upped over multiple rounds, um, or the employees. And so I think people try to push that off as, as long as they can until they have absolute no choice or they've exhausted all options to raise additional capital at any somewhat favorable term. Um, you've seen some companies that are best in class go to venture debt, but venture debt is also pricing you at so for a plus 6%. And so you've got to be able to be a cash flowing business that can also handle 12 to 13% on your cap table. And if you can't, you're probably not top, you know, best in class company. And now you find yourself in a, in a tough predicament. So I think we're still in a period of people are going to try to push this out as long as they can and see if they can get the market to shift, rates to shift, and the comps to shift. So before I ask the next question, I, I believe that you have the ability to submit questions via an app. I could be mistaken about that. We welcome those questions. We've got about eight minutes to go. We'll leave some time for your questions in the last five minutes, which I know Naz is happy to, to address. Before we do that, I wanted to maybe build on your previous answer to ask you, to what extent do you think a closed market for VC-backed IPOs might threaten their viability? Do they have enough funding, do you think, to survive without doing a public offering, or are they at risk? I mean, I think so. I think like if you're at the late stage, right, or if you're at what we call a venture growth company, you know, you've, you've raised at that point seven or eight rounds of capital. You're probably sitting there with a few billion dollars um, in your valuation, if not tens of billions of dollars. Um, and I do think what you'll see from your VCs is the ability to put more money to work, but at significantly more favorable terms for the venture investors. And so, you know, we track... Uh, uh, kind of a venture, an indicator of how founder or investor friendly the market is. And we look at things like liquidation preferences, valuation step ups, time between rounds um, and different fee structures. And, and what you've seen today in this market is this is the most investor friendly or GP friendly market that we've seen um, ever. And effectively, what that means is you have these VCs who are driving the terms. So I think the capital is there for the best in class businesses. But, you know, one of the things I think sometimes gets overlooked is for a VC-backed company, what happened in COVID, it's, ha it's happened over the last year, is effectively you look at your portfolio and you put them into different buckets, maybe three different buckets, and you put more money to work at better terms that are advantageous to the GPs and the top companies. You try to offer your time to the middle companies to help them weather that storm. And then you basically forget about the bottom third. 
And it's, it's not a great outcome if you're that portfolio company, but that's what they end up doing. And so I think the capital is there, but it starts to go to a much smaller set of companies in the venture universe than it was over the last few years. So we wanted to ask about real asset, uh, that whole sector, the infrastructure strategies have seen a lot of interest and a lot of assets raising around $60 billion from investors. In public markets, at least, there's a familiar pattern of this return chasing, performance chasing, flows chasing returns, um, and that is to investors' detriment. So do you find the same in private markets, or do lockups help to moderate the effects of some of those behaviors? I think the lockups help for sure. I think I feel like what we heard quite a bit on the real assets side was I think people were just so worried about inflation and the rate environment and, and just trying to protect against that. And so being in some sort of real asset, you saw kind of growth come in in tandem with private credit and, and the real asset side. And so I think a lot of what you've seen there is can you provide yourself some hedges? And I think people also feel like when you did see for a period of time, um, especially in the commercial space, valuations really decline, could they take advantage of that. I think today the market is probably less clear and you're starting to see um, kind of jury still out. But I think a lot of that was about, you know, can you hedge against the macro factors? So we have had a few audience questions come in. Maybe I'll pose the first of them to you, Naz. Where, where does AI come into play in the alternative investing space? Uh, on the technology side, this questioner is pointing out there's not so much funding. Maybe you could address the first piece. Where does AI come into play? And I'll in the alternative investing space? Yeah, it's a good question. I think, you know, there's been, obviously, when you're thinking about venture, they have, they've tried to do a lot of things over the years to, to drive efficiency and technology with machine learning, et cetera. And I think you've seen models in play before where it's, hey, send us all your portfolio, you know, company statistics, and we'll give you an answer within 48 hours based on our models if you will have success or not. And I think what you found when some of the firms went down that path is that it didn't work all that well because, number one, you had to do a bunch of work to think about how might the TAM change, how might the market change, how might the serviceable market change. And I think a lot of that does come down to investment committee meetings and people doing a ton of work, really trying to like see the forest through the trees. And so I don't think you're going to actually see it. I think you're going to see a lot of VCs talk a lot about it. I don't think you're actually going to see a lot of them actually sit there and, and use that to decide what deals they get into and what they don't. I think where you want to see it is is kind of on the back office operations, whether it's the paperwork, the administrative that goes into these transactions. There's so many lawyers, so many bankers. There's a lot of accountants, et cetera. There's a lot of people on the back end involved in all of these transactions, particularly when you're thinking about running a sale process or a funding round, et cetera. And I think those are the pieces where you're doing a lot of duplicative but very necessary work that you see technology can step in. And you're seeing that now, whether it's, you know, Companies that are helping like make their way through documents and summarize things or, or legal AI agents and assistants and things like that. I think it's more that back office side is where you see the impact. Another question from the audience, um, which was one of our questions, actually, as we prepped for this. Has the rise in yields and the increase in inflows to fixed income affected private equity firms and funds? Yes, I think I would... I would focus on the yields component, right? So if you look at even just last year, um, you've had, I think today we're at somewhere at SOFR plus 600 or something like that. And, and you've got kind of the average yield of maturity um, on a deal supporting a LBO is about 11% to 12%. You go back two years ago, all in net, some of these firms were paying four to 5%. And so it completely changes the economics of how they can go about doing a lot of their transactions in private equity. I also think, when you are thinking about the leverage loan market and trying to go to market, that market also dried up quite a bit because you didn't have the banks who wanted to step in and syndicate those deals. And so, you know, if you look at this year, technically the leverage loan market's only down 20% from where it was last year. I think we'll do 150 billion so far today in leverage loans, the broadly syndicated market. But that also includes all the refinancings that people had to do to clean up the paperwork and, and play, clean up the terms and the covenants. If you pull out those refinancings, that market is down like 80%. And so if you don't have broadly syndicated loan market, private credit steps in, but there's a tremendous amount of transactions that just can't get done. And you've also got, you know, a lot of cap tables, you've got both. You'll have a syndicated loan in there and you also have some private credit investors in there and some private placements. And so the yield component has really just 
hamstrung traditional private equities playbook. And that's where, you know, we talked a little bit about it earlier. You've seen bigger shops move lower, can put more equity in a transaction. You've seen a lot more add-ons. And so you've seen a lot more companies buy smaller businesses and truly boil up that strategy to roll these things up together with smaller check sizes. But the platform strategy from the past couple of years hasn't been there um, given where rates are at. Minutes ago, last question. What's something that's on the PitchBook Research agenda that you're particularly excited about as you look to the future? I mean, I, th I think a lot of the quant work we do is really fascinating today. I think we do a lot of work at kind of just providing more transparency into the underlying assets. And so if we think about how we think about cash flow modeling, we track more fun cash flows at an intimate level than anybody else out there. And so we do a lot of work with our analysts of unpacking if somebody wanted to reach X amount of allocation with X amount of, you know, uh, return, what would they actually need to do to to reach that? And I think we, we do that with quite a bit of accuracy. And so we build that stuff into our software. I think our quantitative models in terms of really unpacking like real returns versus stated returns, we do a lot of work there that we're continue to iterate on. We've done a ton of work building models to help predict when venture-backed businesses will go to market, in what way they'll go to market, and what those outcomes would be. And I think we've been able to do that with some accuracy. And so it's basically being able to apply a quantitative model to private markets that I don't think has been done at large scale like it has in the public markets. I think that's where we're spending a lot of time with our customers. Well, Nazar, this has been a very enlightening conversation. Thanks so much for being our guest on the Longview podcast. We've really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us on The Long View. If you could, please take a minute to subscribe to and rate the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow us on Twitter at SYouth1, which is S-Y-O-U-T-H and the number one. And at Christine underscore Benz. George Cassidy is our engineer for the podcast, and Carrie Gretchik produces the show notes each week. Finally, we'd love to get your feedback. If you have a comment or a guest idea, please email us at thelongview at morningstar.com. Until next time, thanks for joining us. This recording is for informational purposes only and should not be considered investment advice. Opinions expressed are as of the date of recording. Such opinions are subject to change. The views and opinions of guests on this program are not necessarily those of Morningstar Inc. and its affiliates. While this guest may license or offer products and services of Morningstar and its affiliates, unless otherwise stated, he or she is not affiliated with Morningstar and its affiliates. Morningstar does not guarantee the accuracy or the completeness of the data presented herein. Jeff Patak is an employee of Morningstar Research Services, LLC. Morningstar Research Services is a subsidiary of Morningstar Inc. and is registered with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Morningstar Research Services shall not be responsible for any trading decisions, damages, or other losses resulting from or related to the information, data analyses, or opinions, or their use. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. All investments are subject to investment risk, including possible loss of principal. Individuals should seriously consider if an investment is suitable for them by referencing their own financial position, investment objectives, and risk profile before making any investment decision.